Okay. Um, I thought I'd do a little follow up on this uh, topic that came up um, in yesterday's perception course with Schultz, and it was also the same really topic or theme that uh, we were talking to Apostle about. And I also thought I would make this little presentation um, public in case uh, different communities of practice would like to address um, address this theme. So um, I'm going to use ex the example that Apostle used in terms of looking at a rock, and uh, I want you to notice that there's certain um, shifts, certain what I would call shifts in postures, those of you who know the four postures meditations, <clears throat> but it also maps onto uh, Shins and Young's uh, system. So there's a shift from C out to C in. Let's say I'm going to show a shift from C out to feel in. Um, and um, in my four postures meditation, of course, we um, learn what the experience of these different modalities are in our body because they actually postures that are composed from micro actions in the the experiential body in the in the body itself so that's the overview but let's just look at the the example so we'll start with uh we're starting with visual experiential visual experience so see out and i have this term density and the density is how intricate let's say or how many layers or levels of depth of vision visual experience can we get here um, and so we start with i'm looking down on the ground maybe at the beach and i'm i see arrangements of rocks my visual experience here is of high pattern i'm not actually labeling them as rocks i see um, just the pattern and maybe i do see rocks it's mostly a label i'm not really concentrating or focusing. So my visual experience here is of a gestalt pattern, more or less. You can imagine this is a painting. And um, but then maybe I focus on a single rock. I find this rock here very interesting for some reason, although this one seems interesting. I mean, if you look here, you'll see that your your visual palette, let's say, uh, moves around in kind of dallies spend some time on different rocks so a rock becomes interesting to me i focus on a single rock it comes out of this background pattern and here's the rock this is now the rock of my visual experiential density so um now i'm going to look at more detail in the rock i have to maybe move the rock up closer to my face i focus in a different ways with my eyes the uh, quality of my tension changes. Um, and again, the way I'm kind of following what I'm following now are crevices and cracks um, and really trying to uh, be absorbed in this level of detail. This is still a visual experience. And then I start to really maybe I'm working right down in this crack. There's more detail there, but I've gotten to the micro detail and the limit of my vision. I mean, my visual system just can't identify any more detail. Now we want to keep with it here. We want to keep with visual experiential density, which is down this cone. I made them cones because we can map this on to David Levin's work on cognitive cones and the different types of Cognitive cones are associated with different, let's say, species. Uh, so we're at the limit of our visual cognitive cone here. But because we're humans, we can create microscopes. And I can start to see more density in this visual experience, in this journey. So now, again, I'm still looking at this. Maybe I'm trying to understand the microstructure. So I'm using uh, a great deal of focus and attention as I'm looking through a microscope. And then I invent other microscopes. I see more uh, detail and attention. 
and I'm trying to be visually very attentive to this level of detail. I'm still in the visual experiential density here, uh, obviously aided by microscopes. Now, what happens here is at a certain point, there's a dimensional shift. And I take this information and I start to track theories, track it through theories in order to get an experimental work, a empirical work and theory. So this here now becomes highly dependent upon a theoretical con text. Um, and so I can say this is anhydrate, calcium sulfate or sulfide or whatever. And this is its internal structure. So there's a there's a dimensional shift in creating um, this model from this, which is merely visual, and we want they try to co corroborate them. So this is all up to here. It's all visual experiential density. Now we have a um, a shift into um, the kinds of um, of knowledge we have that's highly uh, context dependent upon the theory of carbon bonds and ions and stuff like that. It doesn't mean it's invalid. It's it's just a kind of participation. This the particip visual participation here requires instrumentation and this requires theory. OK, but I would say that this exits the visual experiential density and starts to draw on uh, intellectual paradigms. OK. I could do a different intellectual paradigm, like maybe some kind of plasma theory, and, it, and this would uh, be different than uh, disk like crystalline lattice structure. All right, so this idea of exiting the visual experiential density or exiting the C out uh, is important here. Okay, so now we'll look at the phenomenal attentional density, which is when you're doing Vipassana, it's phenomenal, you know, you're looking at phenomenon. Um, so I'm at uh, the same thing. I get to the micro detail, the limit of my vision. And now, instead of continuing to uh, um, use vision through using um, <clears throat> microscopes, what happens is if I stare at the thing long enough, I don't get any more detail. I get less detail. And this is because I'm actually now shifted toward looking at the eidetic reduction in my memory. In other words, when you remember images, if I, if I ask you to imagine um, the surface of a rock, what's actually happening in your memory are uh, categories of grayscale, let's say. And, and um, this is why when we remember something in our image space in our mind, it doesn't have the kind of detail that ha it has in waking life and actual seeing out. So that uh, this, so that's why we can tell we're using our simulation to imagine, uh, like if I imagine being in my mother's kitchen, there's a lot of simulation going on. It's primarily founded, uh, it's primarily grounded on a feeling tone versus the eidetic, uh, information is hazy like this. So um, so the mistake that people make here is they think that this is somehow a property of the visual attentional density and not realize that they've made a shift into now you're actually looking at mental phenomenon. So the shift has gone from see out to see in. Um, this is extremely critical in the interpretation of the phenomenology of Vipassana, let's say. And um, I think that uh, it's, it needs to be emphasized more. Um, so how do we know when we have this shift? Is because it discharges in the body in a different way. The way, what it feels like when you're seeing out is there's an energy signature in the body those of you who've done my four posture meditation understand that's the energy signature of the wide eye gaze 
Um, and once you start to see in, there's actually micro actions, the postures in your body change and you're into eidetic reduction. You're actually looking at your mind, not at the object anymore. So this has nothing, this has no information on the object or perception in terms of see out. It, it, it doesn't include any information on perception per se, external perception, because now you've shifted to looking at your mind. And then uh, we can go deeper and um, realize that there's a refresh rate here and a, uh, which we would call in process philosophy, a duration over which the threshold of consciousness discharges. Um, we can understand, we can learn something about the wave-like form of uh, attention, conscious attention. Um, but again, this has nothing to do with external world because we've exited the uh, probing of the external world through our perceptual sensory motor perception. Um, and so the world is not uh, um, flashing in and out. Uh, we have not been able to see the 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 uh, world of things, the objects flashing in and out. We've only been able to see our minds flashing in and out. So this is phenomenal attentional density. So uh, if you get to see the refresh rate, that's pretty dense. Uh, there's more densities here, um, but I wanted to address these two. So the important part is that you exit. When you go here, you exit C out and you're into C in. Now, uh, then another thing that can happen is um, you can enter a generative and instead of an eidetic reduction, you can enter a new phase space where you have image generation. Um, so it's, it's a, instead of reduction, it's an explosion of images. Um, and a lot of times this what happens when um, uh, when the mind is starved of um, perceptual uh, stimuli, it'll start to generate its own phase space. So it, this is like in uh, Cassini practice, you end up um, um, entering first 3D spaciousness, which is a uh, property of the body. The body casts 3D spatial awareness. It's part of the perceptual processes of the body so that um, you're starting to um, recreate this in image space. So you can start to move from the eidetic reduction to this kind of generative um, imaginary space. So this is all the phenomenology that is reported. Now, there is a third um, <clears throat> experience and it's called value meaning density. Um, this has to do with when we perceive objects, um, the, the, as we are perceiving, if we let our gaze on the world, we'll notice that we move quickly through some things and then we kind of stop and take a little more time. It's like scrolling through the internet, something catches our eye, or if we're, if we're <clears throat> intentionally looking for something we lost, um, the whole point is, is that the the affective or appetitive drive of the senses are already value laden. Um, um, they come from an arousal state. So there is a correspondence that they're looking for. Um, um, and so um, they're already value uh, laden. And so what happens is <clears throat> we can exit the visual uh, density by moving into uh, the value meaning density. So for example, the rock might start to, um, um, I might project some meaning on the rock about, like I'm looking at a rock here on my desk, it's got all these little sparkles in it and it occurs to me, it looks like some of the web space telescopes um, and it looks like the universe and I'm starting to discharge value and meaning onto this objects, the whole field of object, objects relations is kind of antiquated, but it's uh, it's associated with this. So this is now 
see out has moved to feel in. I could use my creative imagination and uh, create all kinds of meaning making around this object, especially if what I was looking for was already value dense. So if I have a heartache and I'm walking along the beach and I pick up a rock and it seems to speak to me because there was a lot of value in the perceptual gaze, then I can discharge a lot of that value onto an object. And of course, we take these things home and they become meaningful knickknacks to us. Uh, we can get into more symbol or mandala type of uh, meaning density. And then, uh, you know, very few Westerners do this, but we can start to cat categorize the meaning. We can start to take that meaning and push it up the, uh, the hierarchy of um, cognition and start to reify the category rock itself. So it's an abstraction. So it's not that this rock is meaningful, but this is the meaning that rocks have. So this is again, moving into up the cognitive uh, hierarchy. So this is a different way to, uh, but these are, these are feel in densities. Um, so um, yeah, so just recapping really fast. These are see out densities, um, except the last one. Um, these are see in densities and these are feel in densities. So um, what we do, I don't know why that's there already. Okay, so we can call this side, these, these CNs, this is what we call mind. Um, and uh, the, the visual density is just perception and uh, the feel in is psyche. Um, and these kind of, once we start to reify the meaning or we have image space generation, we're using uh, more creative imagination, higher up the cognitive stack, the cognitive architecture. So now we're into semantic meaning and stuff like that. Okay, I hope uh, this helps explain some of your experience. Um, and that's one other uh, thing I'd like to say. Um, this is, um, under the entire project of moving from a phenomenological approach to a, uh, a metaphysics of experience, the metaphysics of, of experience, which is a very large topic, it can contextualize phenomenology versus we take our phenomenology and we create a metaphysics out of it. It's a big deal. Hopefully we'll get to that in the course, maybe not. Uh, but yeah, if you like this video and you want to take it to uh, your community and talk about it, that'd be really great. And let me know what you think.